Okay, good morning. Make sure you all can hear me okay. I presume you can. Uh, we're going to talk today about intraepidermal vesicular dermatitis. And uh, just like last time we talked about subepidermal blisters, there's uh, you know, a couple of different ways of getting this as well. Uh, the three classic ways of getting intraepidermal blisters are uh, by acantholysis, uh, where the cells basically fall apart from one another. And I always like to sort of bring up the etymology of these words, kind of know what it means. Uh, acanth is the Greek word for spine. And so what really we're talking about is say acantholysis or the desmosomal attachments get lost and the cells can no longer sort of hug one another and stay together. So that's uh, acantholysis. And that can be uh, precipitated by a lot of different things. It can be idiopathic in a situation where we just don't know why the cells no longer uh, stay together. Uh, it can be due to biochemical alterations and conditions like Haley-Haley disease where there's a calcium transport problem there, uh, or it can be due to immunobullus, uh, in, you know, deposition of immunoreactants, such as in the immunobullus diseases like pemphigus uh, and, uh, and some of those conditions. And sometimes it can be mechanical uh, patients that get uh, some sort of traumatic etiology. So there'd be a lot of different reasons that you can get acantholysis. Uh, then there can also be spongiosis, Again, that's uh, where you get collection of fluid between the keratinocytes, and then you get blisters that form secondarily to that. And then you can get ballooning degeneration. That's where the individual cells, fluid gets inside the cells. They actually sort of think of them as blowing up like a balloon and when they're filled with uh, liquid as opposed to just air. And then they pop, and then you get a vesicle that forms secondarily to that. And then there's a few other things, epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. Um, you can get blisters occurring in that situation. Again, we talked about trauma, like shearing, things of that nature. So there's there's several different ways of getting it. But the good news is relatively few ways of getting the blister. So when you're looking at one of these cases and you identify that it's an intraepidermal vesicle, uh, the first thing you need to do is then ask yourself what, oh, sorry about that, there we go. So asking yourself then what, you know, uh, you know, what type of intraepidermal vesicle is it, is it? So once you've identified, let's say it's acantholysis, then ask yourself, where is the acantholysis located? Is it just a focal area? Is it associated with a disc keratosis or not? Um, where is it in the epidermis? Is it just above the basal cell layer? Is it in the area just beneath the stratum corneum, for example, the granular cell layer? And then ask yourself what kind of inflammatory cells are in the infiltrate. So these are logical things that you go through here. They're, they're criteria for diagnosis. They're very logical. They're very uh, they're, Once you learn these criteria, which you really need to do, then you start applying them and you apply them logically, you can come up with an accurate diagnosis. And then there are obviously some other ancillary things that we do in, in some cases. Uh, you want to always correlate things with clinical information, uh, with clinical appearance of the lesions, but then you can do things like immunofluorescence studies, uh, direct immunofluorescence, which is our classic technique that we use for uh, the uh, immunobullus uh, intraepidermal uh, vesicular dermatitis. So let's start off taking a look at this one here. Um, this is uh, a blister at low magnification uh, that gives you uh, small little itchy papules and usually older individuals that usually does not involve follicles. When you get this involvement of a follicle such as this, it's pretty extensive. That will favor the diagnosis of an immunobullus acantholytic disorder. And then ask yourself, well, where's the level of the split in the epidermis? Is it, is it high? Is it just above the basal cell layer? As you can see here, it's really very high in the epidermis. It's sitting right at the level of the granular cell layer and just beneath the stratum corneum. So this would be a classic example of uh, one of the superficial forms of pemphigus, pemphigus foliaceus, uh, possibly fogo selvagem, which is the Brazilian type of pemphigus. It looks almost identical to this. And then the last of the three is so-called Sinier Usher or pemphigus erythematosus, which usually would have a little bit more of an interface dermatitis as well, because that's kind of a combination of lupus erythematosus and superficial pemphigus together. So when we make this diagnosis, rather than just calling it one of the three types, we usually just call it superficial pemphigus and then correlate that with clinical appearance. There's one other finding in the slide that's really quite helpful here as well, or at least it's a good clinical pearl. Uh, notice how much parakeratosis and crust we have here. And patients that have uh, superficial pemphigus, they get a very, very crusted appearance clinically. Uh, in fact, a lot of times that, that scale crust, it's not just scale, it's actually got 
uh, some crust in there as well. It's got serum in there. See, there's some uh, serum up here in the cornified layer in this area. And it's also got the cells that go along with it, the acanthalytic cells. So it's a little different kind of, of scale crust than we see, like, say, the scale of, uh, of psoriasis or a little, say, scale crust that we see with somebody that's got allergic contact dermatitis. So it's kind of, in fact, it's been given the name of, of so-called cornflake scale. So those are the, uh, so that's another thing when you see a patient clinically that's got this big, thick, cornflake-like scale area, the widespread involvement, uh, usually the uh, the trunk and extremities. Uh, you should think about the diagnosis of superficial pemphigus. And if by chance there's involvement uh, of the photodistributed areas, let's say the V of the neck, maybe the face, uh, areas of the upper arms or whatever, you might start thinking about the possibility of uh, the combination of lupus and superficial pemphigus, the so-called uh, center usher or pemphigus erythematosus. Now, the infiltrate and pemphigus is uh, usually lymphocytes, but sometimes you can get a fair number of eosinophils. And actually, in some cases of patients that, that have uh, pemphigus vulgaris, for example, they can actually have an extensive uh, high number of eosinophils, or a very uh, eosinophilia that can be pretty uh, prominent. So that happens very commonly but it does happen every now and then. So sometimes in, in pemphigus, superficial pemphigus, pemphigus vulgaris, you'll see uh, quite a few uh, eosinophils in that. Okay, let's move on to the next case. And uh, we're still in the category of, uh, of immunobullous acantholytic disorders. So again, this is not a, uh, a quiz. So these are uh, known cases, if you will. And let's go to higher magnification. This one right here is a beautiful example. We'll show both of these two slides. But notice here we've got a another intraepidermal process. It's within the epidermis. And we've got the acantholysis. And notice here, as opposed to the last case, where the acantholysis was present at the top of the epidermis, here we're looking just above the basal cell layer. And a lot of people refer to this as the, uh, you know, uh, tombstones, the, the row of tombstones, if you will, the residual basal or keratinocytes and the overlying epidermis is pretty much just sloughed away. So uh, this is a, a nice example of pemphigus vulgaris. And so here we see the roof of the blister. There's usually a minimal uh, dyskeratosis in uh, pemphigus vulgaris. So this is just basically a, a super basal or cleft. You get the epidermis gets sheared away and there's usually not much in the way of dyskeratosis. So this isn't a, a slow process. It's an immunobullous process, kind of occurs relatively quickly. Uh, there's no death of the epidermis. You just get a blister that forms, and then you can see the, uh, the nice example of that. So here's a, a hair follicle that was involved. So again, in the immunobullous uh, forms of these acantholytic disorders, the follicular epithelium is, is commonly involved, whereas in Grover's disease and that sort of thing, it, it's usually not as commonly involved. So that this uh, does show a little bit of dyskeratosis up here, but uh, it's not as prevalent as we see, like for example, in Derrier's disease and some other things like that. I don't think we're gonna show Derrier's disease today, but that's something where you do see acantholytic dyskeratosis as opposed to just pure um, acantholysis. Uh, infiltrate again in, in pemphigus. Uh, again, maybe uh, usually mostly lymphocytes, but sometimes you'll see a fair number of eosinophils. Now there's a subtype of pemphigus vulgaris where you actually get extensive follicular involvement and can also get a pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia associated with that. And that is known as pemphigus um, vegetans. So it's where you clinically you'll see these vegetating verrucous lesions often in the intertriginous areas, uh, the groin and the axilla, places like that. And you'll actually get um, these large areas where there's pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia in acantholysis. And actually you may get a lot of eosinophils in that variant of pemphigus as well. So it's, it's a type of pemphigus vulgaris just with a secondary pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, if you will. That, that's at least the way I think about it. Um, if you take, talk to somebody like Dr. Yancey, people that do this for a living and they're just really focusing purely on these interesting uh, bl you know, blistering diseases, there may actually be some differences in the uh, the genetics, if you will, or possibly the antigens that are targeted uh, that causes lesions such as pemphigus uh, vegetans versus pemphigus vulgaris. But but I think of it as basically one general disease, whereas one gives you a lot of epithelial hyperplasia, occurs in slightly different locations, 
it almost looks like a neoplasm when you see it clinically uh, versus pemphigus uh, vulgaris, which looks pretty much like this. One other thing about pemphigus vulgaris, just as a note, um, sometimes we'll get a biopsy that shows um, maybe they've biopsied pretty much look, normal looking skin and uh, there really aren't too many blisters in the patient, but they still think they might have pemphigus. If you look right at the edge of the biopsy where they do a punch biopsy and hopefully uh, the clinician is submitting a punch biopsy, you'll actually get the um, Nikolsky sign that gets produced at the, or the Asbo Hansen sign, if you will, that's produced at the edge of the blister. So you can actually shear the epidermis off when you're doing your punch. And that's not really an artifact, that's actually a, a lesion that's induced by the punch biopsy itself, which could be helpful um, in a situation where you really don't have all the classic changes that we see um, in this slide here. So uh, the other, uh, other piece of the skin over here basically just shows an area where there's just, you know, like over here, for example, you might actually see a little bit of acantholysis right at the edge right there where the punch was done in normal skin and that's actually inducing the blister. So that's not an artifact, that's actually the skin is fragile and it shears because of the uh, fact that you've actually traumatized the skin by doing your punch biopsy. Okay, so let's move on to the next case. So here we've got acantholysis, but notice in the last case of pemphigus and in the first case of pemphigus, uh, superficial pemphigus, we had involvement over a broad front so we had involved from side to side. There were hair follicles that were involved. Here we've got focal acantholysis. So when you see just a focal area like this, um, you should start thinking about things like Grover's disease, for example, which gives you focal acantholytic. Here's the acantholysis. And then dyskeratosis. These are the dyskeratotic keratinocytes here, which are the corones, which are acantholytic dyskeratotic um, granular and cells and cells in the superbasilar area here. And then you get grains, which are acantholytic, dyskeratotic, granular cells and parakeratotic nuclei. So these are some grains up here and these are corones here. That is not specific for dairy age disease. You can see it in any of the conditions where you can see focal acantholytic dyskeratosis. Grover's, dairy age, linear unilateral dairy age disease, um, you know, pay the familial dyskeratotic comedones. So there's about five or six different conditions where you can actually see focal acantholytic dyskeratosis. So it's not specific for dairy age. So just make sure when you're reading the textbooks that you don't make that mistake and realize that it is a reaction pattern in the epidermis that we can see with a number of different conditions. So here we've got Grover's disease and uh, it's an itchy condition. Uh, patients excoriate these. Sometimes you'll just see an excoriation, maybe a tiny bit of acantholysis to the side. There are about five or six different histologic patterns of uh, Grover's disease. We can see the dairy A type that we're looking at right here, but you can also see a superficial pemphigus type, a deep pemphigus type, a haley haley type, a spongiotic type, and even a, an area where you can sometimes see epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. So there have been about five or six different types of Grover's disease uh, described histologically, just like now we've got about five or six different types of lymphomatoid papulosis. There are several different types of uh, Grover's disease as well. And a clue to the diagnosis of Grover's, other than the focality of the process, um, is number one, no involvement of follicles. If you get involvement of follicles, you may be dealing more likely with an actual immunobullous disease. And number two, if you actually see more than one pattern in the same specimen, so let's say you had a little area here of the dairy A type, and then maybe over here you had a little, say, spongiotic area, because spongiosis, there's a spongiotic variant of, of uh, Grover's disease as well, that would tend to favor Grover's as opposed to dairy A's, for example. Or let's say we saw a little Haley-Haley uh, pattern in one area, and then an area of uh, dairy A type in another one, that would also make you favor the diagnosis of Grover's. So we used to call Grover's disease transient acantholytic dermatosis. Uh, we now know that it's not transient. A lot of patients will have the disease for many years. I've had patients I've been following my clinic now for years. Um, the infiltrate also is often lymphocytic, but you very commonly see some eosinophils, some eosinophils in this biopsy here. And then uh, the other uh, thing about uh, dairy Grover's disease is that it's not always confined to older men. Uh, sometimes we see younger women that have this. And uh, I don't know why it's also seen in younger women, but it is. And uh, 
Tim Berger and his colleagues in San Francisco have suggested that maybe it's younger women that eat a lot of sushi and get mercury that causes it. I'm not sure that's really the true reason for it, but uh, we do see it in younger women. So just because uh, you get a diagnosis back of Grover's in a young person, don't think your dermatophologist doesn't know what he's talking about. Sometimes Grover's disease doesn't read the textbook and it appears in people of different ages. So that's uh, an example of uh, Grover's, which is yet another intraepidermal vesicular dermatitis. Okay. Now let's take a look at this condition. Also, we have intraepidermal acanthalysis here. And uh, notice that once again, in this case, we've got a relatively diffuse involvement. We've got involvement here. It extends all the way over to this area. And now, as opposed to the first two conditions that we saw, which was uh, a very superficial blister, and then we saw one that was confined to the area just beneath the, uh, the epidermis, just above the basal cell layer. Now we've got involvement throughout the entire epidermis. So when we see this pattern, uh, we think of the so-called dilapidated brick wall, if you will, pattern that we see with so-called uh, Haley Haley's disease or benign chronic familial pemphigus. And it was given that name because as opposed to uh, regular pemphigus, number one, it was inherited, autosomal dominant. So uh, this would cluster in families, whereas pemphigus vulgaris does not cluster in families. It, it clusters in uh, certain genetic haplotypes, like in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, it's very common there. Uh, but this was not very dangerous to patients. And we get these localized areas in the uh, areas where the skin was uh, intertriginous areas, the axilla commonly around the neck, the groin, and uh, they wouldn't die from their disease like patients with pemphigus when they, in the old days before they had corticosteroids would basically die. If you slough off your skin, you lose your barrier, you can't maintain your uh, uh, mineral metabolism and your fluid electrolyte balance and patients with pemphigus vulgaris that used to be uniformly fatal or they would get an infection and die from it. So it was a horrible disease back in the days before steroids were introduced. And the first real breakthrough was the introduction of high dose corticosteroids. 60, 100 milligrams a day, grams of steroids were, were used in some cases. And uh, patients would uh, sadly uh, get extremely cushingoid with, with pemphigus. Uh, they would uh, get secondary infections and get megacolon and die of, of the steroid complications in some cases, but at least they wouldn't, wouldn't die of their pemphigus. So, uh, and that was actually, interestingly enough, that original treatment was uh, introduced by uh, Dr. Walter Lever, who you may remember uh, from your dermatopathology readings of Lever's textbook. Well, Lever was also very interested in uh, immunobullous diseases in the old days. And uh, he was one of the first guys to recommend high dose corticosteroids for the treatment, interestingly enough. And uh, so uh, that was uh, kind of a historical sideline. But this is what you see in Haley Haley disease. You get diffuse acanthalysis throughout the epithelium with dyskeratosis, as you see here. So now we have some corones, grains up here, and corones. Okay, so this is not derriase, this is Haley Haley disease. So this has uh, some, some forms of Haley Haley don't really have much dyskeratosis, but it's actually fairly common to get some dyskeratosis with Haley Haley. And then you get this diffuse involvement of the entire epithelium uh, and it's often diffuse, not just in a focal area, but it goes from side to side in the biopsy when you when you do that. And we see patients that uh, that have this clinically get this very macerated, crusted uh, epithelium. And, and if you look under the axilla, for example, where it's really macerated, it also has the uh, description that's what's been said to be sort of like wet tissue paper. Very, very macerated epithelium. And the other thing you have to look for in Haley Haley disease too, because it is in areas that are nutritionous and, and macerated, look for secondary infections. Uh, very common to see secondary candidal infection, uh, common to see secondary herpes infection um, in lesions of, uh, of Haley Haley. I would say real common, but it's not uncommon. So you want to look to see if there's any secondary um, viral cytopathic effect. Nothing in the in these in this section here, but that's not an altogether uncommon thing when you're dealing with patients that have Haley Haley disease. So just remember that. And, and that's another disease where you can see acanthalysis. So you get two acanthalytic disorders at the same time. Um, also, that general rule of thumb, if you're dealing with a real uh, disorder of acanthalysis and not something that's just kind of focal like Grover's disease, the hair follicles are involved. And here you see the acanthalysis tracking right down into that follicle. And it's got that same diffuse uh, dilapidated brick wall pattern that we see with uh, Haley Haley and the epidermis. So it, 
is tracks right down into the follicle as well. Okay, let's shift gears. And um, now we're looking at a different condition where we've got an, a blister in the epidermis. And um, notice the pattern this time is a little bit different. Um, well, actually, there are two slides in this. Sorry about that. That This is a different, uh, a different situation. Um, here we've got another diffuse acantholytic process. And this looks very much like um, the last case in many ways. This, is, this has got areas in some zones that look almost like pemphigus vulgaris. But in these other areas, you've got more diffuse involvement and you've got the overlying epidermal involvement here. So this is another example of, of Haley Haley disease here. And the other case, actually, I'm going to go back because um, I just looked at the slide. And even though it does look like Haley Haley, it's got the pattern of Haley Haley, it said it might be the Haley Haley form of Grover's disease. So I don't know for sure if that's the case because it is involved in the follicle, but it is relatively focal. So if you get Grover's disease, it's got the Haley Haley pattern. It, it looks just like the Haley Haley pattern. Uh, in somebody that has the disease. So it's possible that this could be Grover's, although with that follicle involvement, I don't know, I might argue that a little bit. But the next case is an example uh, of Haley Haley that's more diffuse. So notice that even though it's, uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting because these diseases often can have some overlap between them. If you just saw this area right here, you might say, wow, that looks a lot like Pemphigus vulgaris. But then you look over here and you can see that the upper part of the epidermis is also involved. And you've got this area here where there's a lot of crusting, there's some dyskeratosis. So it, it, this, if you just have this one area, you might say, gosh, that's not so easy to tell. And I think it's educational that that perspective also, because a lot of people, if you read the text, we say, well, these, these always look different. I mean, you can always tell there's between Pemphigus vulgaris and Haley Haley. You can't always. Sometimes it is difficult. If you just had this field right here alone, with nothing else, you might say, well, that's a super basilar cleft, and it looks very good for Pemphigus vulgaris. But over here, you can see that it's actually not just only super basilar, it's actually involving the uh, epidermis above the basal cell layer. And over here, you've got some dyskeratosis as well. So this would be a little more challenging if you had this slide. But this was another example of Haley Haley. And notice how diffuse this is, it involves the entire epidermis, both from one side of the biopsy to the other. And uh, there's also a hair follicle that's involved over here as well. So um, again, you've got some tracking down into the follicle. So this is a nice example uh, of Haley Haley. This doesn't have as much acanthosis as the other case. And it's interesting and a little bit more challenging because it's also uh, got some areas that look like it's just super basilar in some zones. So it's, it's educational from that perspective. Here's the roof. And notice that in contrast to the case of that Pemphigus vulgaris case we saw before, this has a lot of dyskeratosis and the acantholysis in the overlying roof. So that would also favor Haley Haley. But just remember that even though it's supposed to look like the dilapidated brick wall, you know, that sort of looks almost like maybe a dilapidated uh, little small fence. It's not quite as, as wall-like, if you will. The epidermis is, is not as thick here. So it looks a little bit different <clears throat> in this case than the other one. Okay, now let's look at this uh, specimen here, which uh, shows a different type of blistering totally. So now I'm going to ask you what kind of vesicle are we looking at here? Is this acantholysis? Is it um, ballooning or is it spongiosis? And here we can see that there's collection of fluid between the keratinocytes and it's formed these little blisters. So we've got liquid that starts collecting between the keratinocytes. It gets more and more and more and more. And then finally, the keratinocytes get pushed aside. They don't really, you know, the desmosomes are still sort of, they're holding the cells together, but they get broken. So they're not really lysed because of any sort of chemical or uh, immunoreactant that gets deposited or complement whatever that comes in and it sort of severs them like a, a knife. They sort of get broken almost like a mechanical force that, that sort of just pops them, if you will, and it forms these little blisters in the skin. So this is an example of spongiosis. And I mean, it looks like a sponge here. And when a sponge really gets really big, then it forms these little microvesicles. And the microvesicles, when they get big enough, just like any 
balloon or blister, you know, it can pop. When it pops, where does that liquid go? Well, it can go down into the dermis. You can, it can actually, uh, you know, lead to what we call reticular alteration. You've got these little strands of collagen in the papillodermis are just holding the dermis like, you know, rope trying to pull the epidermis down and keep it from floating away and forming a blister, but it usually loses uh, that battle. And it actually ends up forming a true blister. And it's it's not an immunobullous blister. And this isn't like bullous pemphigoid. It isn't like, um, you know, pemphigus vulgaris, any of those conditions. This is really, it, it's immunologic because it's basically some type of uh, hypersensitivity reaction that causes the spongiosis to come in there. But it's not really an immunobullous disease in the traditional sense. So this is a spongiotic blister that has developed as a consequence of some type of hypersensitivity reaction. And in this case, the hypersensitivity reaction was an insect bite. So this is an example of a bullous arthropod assault reaction. And you know, some patients, if they have an underlying uh, immunologic disorder, if they have say like a uh, lymphoma or leukemia, or they have HIV infection, something like that, they get these exaggerated insect bite reactions that can give you lots of spongiosis and they can get blistering that forms. And children quite commonly will, will get uh, immunobullous, uh, dis, uh, well, they, they get uh, vesicular arthropod assault reactions. Uh, when you have a kids, they, they more commonly get that. And here you can see the, uh, the eosinophils in here. There's tons of eosinophils in the infiltrate. So here we got a, a blister in a different mechanism. So we had acantholysis first. We saw acantholysis superficial, we saw acantholysis deep, we saw acantholysis without dyskeratosis, we saw acantholysis with dyskeratosis, we saw focal, we saw a diffuse, and then we looked at the infiltrate. So now we're looking at mechanism number two, we've got spongiosis causing the blister, and the spongiosis was so florid here that it actually ended up leading to a, a secondary intraepidermal and subepidermal blister, and over here it's a true subepidermal blister, but it's occurred because of an intraepidermal vesicular process that then led to a secondary a subepidermal vesicular dermatitis. Okay, here's another example. Again, so when you think of blisters in the skin, um, you know, dermatologists usually immediately go to, oh my God, it's immunobullous. The guy's got pemphigus, pemphigoid, I'm gonna have to put him on rituximab or long-term steroids and all this, that, and the other, but there are lots of other diseases they can give you blisters in the skin that are not immunobullous. So just remember that, that we're talking about uh, an end stage reaction that can occur from a lot of different approaches. And yes, I do want you to sort of at least rule out the immunobullous disease when people come in with blisters, but there are lots of other settings where people get blisters as well. And here's another one. Uh, this is a uh, vesicle that occurred because of a collection of a lot of neutrophils in the epidermis in the subcorneal location Okay, so when we think of a subcorneal blister, we start thinking once again of superficial pemphigus. We look and see if there's a lot of acantholysis here. We might start thinking about bullus epitigo, which is bacteria that have epidermolytic toxin that, that causes a subcorneal blister. And then of course, staph scald and skin syndrome, which is in that same category. And then we think of other things that can give you intraepidermal subcorneal blisters. Uh, and here there's some neutrophils associated with that, the polys in the simple trait. And whenever you see neutrophils in the cornified layer or in this location, I want you to always be thinking about psoriasis, but also about fungal infections. So always like a reflex arc. I want you to instantly go to neutrophils in the cornified layer, subcorneal blister containing polys. We need to rule out a fungal infection. And you would always look for that. You would always do a PAS stain if you can't see the organisms with H&E. If you can see with an H&E, and I don't know if we're going to be able to appreciate that on this slide here, there actually were uh, fungi sitting right in this little area. That's where they love to live. This is called the sandwich sign. They like to live in this zone where the neutrophils are and the basket weave cornified layer and the parakeratotic cornified layer right in this little sandwich area right here. And if you can see them, you don't need to do a PAS stain. You can just diagnose it. It's really basically like a histologic um, KOH preparation. Over here, there's a lot of them here. So we didn't do a PAS stain in this case. Why charge the patient another, you know, $50, $100, $75, whatever the, the charge is 
if you can see it on an H and E, it's a waste. We like to reduce waste in dermatology. So there's no reason to charge a patient if you can see the H and E's, uh, see the organism with H and E, and it's got this pattern. So this is yet another intraepidermal non-immunobullous cause of blistering. Okay, so this this was not due to uh, if you did an immunofluorescence study on this, maybe the, the clinician thought it was benfigoid and did an immunofluorescence study. Well, it would be not, it would be negative wouldn't have any deposition in IgG C3. And then notice this also, just like the case of the bull's bug bite, has got lots of papillary dermal edema. So spongiosis, secondary papillary dermal edema due to inflammation and whatnot, not an immunobullous disease, but also can give you blistering. So bullous dermatophytosis, another cause of a blister in the skin that can be intraepidermal and subepidermal secondarily but it's not due to immunobullous causes. So lots of good teaching points in this case. One other thing about uh, dermatophytosis, we mentioned pemphigus um, is having eosinophil sometimes. Well, dermatophytosis very commonly has, has eosinophils in it. So yeah, neutrophils in the cortified layer, but lots of eosinophils commonly in the, in the dermis as well. So just, so don't think bite all the time when you see eosinophils, don't think drug all the time. Also eos can be seen with dermatophyte infections. So uh, just remember that as well. And then one other final thing, the further away the organism is to human beings, to being adapted to humans, the more inflammation the fungal organism will induce. So if you get a zoonotic uh, or an anthrop, a, a, uh, or maybe a, a geophilic uh, type of uh, dermatophyte, say a, a T. Uh, violatia that likes to say live in cows, for example, if that gets, if, if you have a farmer that, that gets uh, a dramatified infection from handling his cattle, for example, that's going to give a very brisk inflammatory infiltrate versus something like T. rubrum, which may basically live in somebody's nail without causing any inflammation for years. So the more adaptive they are to people, the less inflammation you get. So this would probably, with this much inflammation, you might be thinking about something like a, uh, an unusual trichophyton infection, or maybe even a microsporum infection. Maybe this person had a cat, kitten, and got uh, microsporum. We don't see so many microsporum uh, cases today, but uh, uh, we do uh, occasionally see it, and uh, usually it's, it's, it's carried by an animal. Okay, another example here uh, of uh, a blistering disorder that is caused by a spongiosis, and so we've had dermatophyte, we've had uh, a bug bite, and now we have probably the most common cause of spongiosis, and that's allergic contact dermatitis. So allergic contact dermatitis also gives you lots of spongiosis, and if you see people that have poison ivy and they come see you in the clinic, guess what? They got lots of blisters, okay? And those blisters are not caused by deposition of IgG and C3 at the dermal junction. It's not caused by IgG and C3 between the keratinocytes. It's caused by a Th1, Th2 type reaction due to type 4 uh, cell mediated immunity allergic contact dermatitis. So basically you're getting um, spongiosis with lymphocytes. Often you'll see eosinophils in the spongiotic foci and you'll often see eosinophils down in the dermal component. Now, do you have to see EOs, allergic contact dermatitis? The answer to that is no. So you can get allergic contact dermatitis without a single eosinophil. So don't let the type of infiltrate be, it's, it's never a criterion for diagnosis, okay, alone. You can get dermatitis herpetiformis with lots of eosinophils. You can get cell poor bullous pemphigoid with no inflammation at all. You can get bullous pemphigoid with neutrophils sometimes. So don't let the infiltrate um, fool you, if you will. Do you often see EOs in allergic contact dermatitis? Sure, you do. But in this case, I'm not seeing very many. But that doesn't mean that it's not allergic contact dermatitis. And then notice also over here, you've got papillary dermal edema again. So when you get lots of spongiosis in the epidermis, it often goes hand in hand with papillary dermal edema. This whole thing's inflamed you got spongiosis, it's actually occurred to such a degree that it's actually formed little blisters, bubbles in the skin, and then you get secondary papillary dermal edema, and then that can lead to a, a, a big intraepidermal blister or a subepidermal blister when these lesions, when these little bubbles pop. 
So just remember how this works, okay? Remember how this works. And this uh, infiltrate usually in, in allergic con contact dermatitis is usually relatively superficial. The bullous bug bite is usually deeper. You've injected something down into the skin with allergic contact dermatitis. You're basically getting uh, the allergen is, is uh, exposed to the skin from the outside in, okay? So I don't know what caused this guy's allergic contact dermatitis, but it very well could have been poison ivy in this situation. Okay, the last one we're going to look at is basically kind of a combination where we have two patterns of inflammation uh, that cause blistering here. And uh, let's take a look at this little blister over here. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this isn't the world's best example of this one, sadly enough. I guess the recut didn't show it, but there's still a couple of areas over here that do show it. And I guess that's probably the value of, of getting a, uh, uh, a case that's a little bit funny because this is kind of what we see in the real world. And the RECA didn't show it, but this is an example of herpes virus infection. Okay, in herpes virus infection, you can see a little bit of the change here. And uh, normally in herpes, you'll get acanthalysis plus ballooning degeneration. Okay, so what happens first in herpes? The ballooning degeneration happens first, and then the acanthalysis happens secondarily. So you get a real early lesion of herpes, and this is off to the side of the area where there was a lot of um, acanthalysis. You get these changes here, which you really can't see very well. This is high as this, this uh, image will go here. But what happens in ballooning is fluid starts collecting inside the keratinocytes. And in a herpes virus infection, because it is an, a viral infection of the cell, it gets alteration of the DNA of the nucleus of the cell and you start getting um, the gunmetal gray appearance, if you will, of the nuclei of the keratinocytes. They start getting, they start swelling. They start developing this, this unusual bluish gray color, which you can kind of begin to appreciate on some of these cells over here. Then they become multinucleated. So you get the, the viral particles, the viral machinery is starting to cause this stuff to produce uh, the nucleic acid, and you actually get two nuclei within the cell as opposed to one. And then you start getting certain viral, um, like inclusions in there. You get the so-called Cowdery A and the Cowdery B bodies, which are little clusters of viruses. So this is, becomes a virus factory, if you will. And then the cells break apart from one another because they become abnormal because of what the virus is doing to the cell. And then they start floating freely in the vesicle space. We may have one of those cells right over here. So this is an example of a, of a lesion to the side of a classic herpes virus infected cell that should have a lot of, uh, of acanthalytic cells. We don't really see that. So this is really an early lesion of herpes virus infection. And you even got a dyskeratotic cell over here. So uh, normally, we will see a lot more acanthalytic cells inside the space here. Um, and the thing is, these cells can appear at the top of the blister, they can appear at the bottom of the blister, they can appear at the side. So we always tell our residents to scrape everything. Don't just scrape the base of the blister, scrape the base, the center, the top, put everything on the slide if you're doing a GIMSA stain, because we want to see everything we can. If you did a GIMSA stain of this blister, you'd, you'd be out of luck. There's really not any acanthalytic cells there to look at. Let's look at this one over here. Maybe we have a few more on in this side. And yeah, we do here. We actually, in the, look at this, this is great. Here, we actually have some of the cells that are floating freely in the space here. So we've got a, a cell with uh, this irregular chromatin. Uh, there may even be another nucleus over here. Uh, and these are now acanthalytic and they're floating in the blister space here. So this is, an, the, here's, this is, subtle lesion. <laughs> so you don't always see lots of acanthalytic balloon cells in herpes virus infection. Here we've got like two or three. So we're still able to make the diagnosis. And also notice that inside this blister, there are a lot of neutrophils. And that's actually pretty common as well. You'll actually see a fair number of neutrophils in a lesion of herpes, especially in a late lesion. And the greater the number of neutrophils, the longer the lesion has been present, and the fewer the number of acanthalytic cells that are present here. So that may be one of the reasons that we don't have a lot left because the neutrophils have come in and kind of wiped most of it out. This may be a resolving lesion. And then if you uh, look down here, you can see neutrophils down here in the, uh, in the dermis as well. So a nice example of a, of a kind of an early lesion 
uh, or, or subtle lesion of herpes virus infection. The thing about herpes, if you get a late lesion, they can actually um, have a lot of different dermal reaction patterns can develop after the herpes lesion is kind of gone away. Um, you can see um, uh, granulomatous inflammation. You can see lichen infiltration. You can see vasculitis. Um, here you see some early, look at this. This is a better section than the one I showed you before. These show the ballooning, ballooned keratinocytes here with the abnormal um, nucleoplasm over here. And there's one that's got three nuclei, one, two, three, you can see it right there. So here's the, the lesion of herpes just kind of at the base, still in the epidermis before the cells become acatholytic and form the actual little blister here. So uh, in this area here, you've kind of got some early changes of herpes virus infection, plus the little neutrophilic infiltrate in the, in the blister. So a uh, nice example of both acantholysis and ballooning degenera de degeneration um, in herpes virus infection there. Okay, well, that's a, an overview, if you will, of the various ways of getting uh, intraepidermal vesicular dermatitis. I believe we may have an unknown session again on this Friday that Dr. Ray is going to do. So uh, please feel free to go to our website, uh, learn as much as you can about what we have to offer, both from an educational service perspective. And uh, we're happy to uh, have you as our audience and look forward to having you at our next session. So thank you for attending. And... Uh, as I say before, keep, keep looking at those slides. Take care.